This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a lovely summer so far, or winter if you're south of the equator. The Wild Team is busy working on episodes for the next season, but I wanted to share something special with you that I think you'll like. This is an episode from the podcast Living Planet from Deutsche Welle. They tell environment stories from around the world. In this episode, they explore efforts to bring life back to seabeds off the coast of Scotland. And we also learn about an app that can tell what species a frog is by its song. A sort of Shazam for frogs. (laughs) I hope you enjoy the episode. DW Living Planet with Charlie Shield. Hello and welcome to the program. This week on the show, we hear of efforts to bring life back into seabeds off the coast of Scotland. We show people what's out there. Amazing things that some people just think you'd only find in tropical seas. They realise, actually, there's stuff right on our doorstep that needs protected. And the Australian Frog Shazam. Yep, an app to identify frogs by their love songs. And why that's even worth the space it'll take up on your phone. For most species, we still are at the point where if we give them a chance, they can recover as well. And frogs can, pun intended, bounce back. All that coming up on Living Planet. I'm Charlie Shield. Firstly, we're going underwater. Off the coast of Scotland to talk about the health of seabeds. These are not, as the name might suggest, cute underwater furniture that crabs and squid tuck themselves into when it's bedtime, resting their heads on soft bits of coral and pulling sheets of silky seaweed up to their chins. No. Seabed actually refers to the ocean floor. It's made up of sediment, decaying sea animals, sometimes volcanic ash, and also, in some parts of the world, enormous untapped rare earth metals. When there's too much trawl fishing, dredging or mining of these metals, it can cause potentially irreversible destruction of the sea floor. And that reduces the ocean's ability to store carbon, and it also leads to the loss of some of our underwater friends. That's exactly what happened in Scotland's Lamlash Bay, until a group of campaigners took it upon themselves to try and reverse the damage. Richard Baines has the story. You've not got to go very far before you see sea urchins and sea hares and little nudibranchs, gobies and shannies, little fish. Howard Wood describes the natural wonders below the calm, clear waters of Lamlash Bay here on the Isle of Arran. It's a stunning semicircle of silver water, the steep rock of Holy Island at its centre. The seabed was a mass of colourful life in the 1970s when Howard started scuba diving here. Then, things changed. Through the late 1970s and 1980s, us divers, local divers, we started to see a difference in the flatfish we'd see, the condition of the seabed. It started deteriorating, and by the late 80s, you were seeing species disappear year on year. You realise that, you know, this isn't a long, slow evolution of change. This is rapid. That happened after the UK scrapped laws restricting fishing within three miles or five kilometres of the shore. A new type of dredger also allowed fishers to hunt shellfish on rocky seabed that was previously unfishable, such as Lamlash Bay. By the 1990s, the once rich seabed here was an underwater desert. Howard and friends decided to act. The catalyst was my friend Don McNeish coming back from New Zealand and he looked out a project in Auckland called the Lee No-Take Zone. The area was one of the world's first no-take zones where no fishing of any kind or extraction of any resources is allowed. 
Don McNeish met the late Dr Bill Ballantyne, the renowned marine biologist who'd established that zone. It was Bill that inspired us to basically do something in Lamlash Bay. Bill said to, to Don, he said, you know, you've you got to be prepared, this will take you at least 10 years. He didn't get that right. It, it took us 13 years. <laughs> but eventually, in 2008, the Scottish minister, Richard Lockhead, designated the no-take zone. That legal ban was on just 2.7 square kilometres of the bay, around a third of it, which held the most important habitats. It had to be a small area so as to prevent objections from fishers and others. The benefits of the Lamlash Zone are now becoming apparent. We've seen a general increase in biodiversity in the no-take zone compared to the areas just next to it. Marine biologist Dr Bryce Stewart from York University in England has studied the changes. We've got nearly four times the density of king scallops in the no-take zone than back in 2010. And they're also much bigger, much older and much more reproductively productive as well. We've seen a big increase in the number of lobsters. Some years there's been as many as four times the density of lobsters in the no-take zone than in the areas around it. Seaweeds, corals and other forms of life have also blossomed, helping the zone to store carbon and making it attractive for dive tourism. I put on my wetsuit and snorkel to have a look for myself. So I'm out in the no-take zone now with some small fish some crabs. I saw some thin, brittle stalks of coral, which I think is male, and it's a really rare habitat. And that is one of the things that needed to recover here. His success at establishing the country's first no-take zone meant that in 2015, Howard Wood won the prestigious Goldman International Award for environmental activists. Now his work and his organisation COAST, the community of Aaron Seabed Trust, has become an inspiration for others, as the New Zealand project was for him. Four no-take zones are now established in the UK and the idea is spreading to other countries. Coasts get contacted by individuals and organisations across Europe and across the world. I had one a few months ago from someone in Spain. I've helped uh, someone a few years ago in Mauritius. The initial answer back is, get the community on board and the politicians will slowly follow. Wood says without community support, the no-take zone at Lamlash Bay would not have happened. Coast continues to win over local people and the wider Scottish community. We go and have a guddle in the rock pools, get our hands wet and see what we can find. I'm just going to have a look under these rocks, under some of this seaweed and look at that straight away. Jenny Stark works for Coast and describes how they get people to back conservation. We show people what's out there by showing them these amazing things that some people just think you'd only find in tropical seas. They realise, actually, there's stuff right on our doorstep that needs protected. We can show the community the change. Underwater photography and footage is vital. A picture paints a thousand words, and that really is how you can show the impact of unsustainable and damaging fishing. One of the major effects of the no-take zone here has been a spillover of life into the waters around it. That's helped stocks in the surrounding area, where some fishing is allowed, and that in turn has won support from some fishers. Creel fishers who catch lobsters, langoustines and crabs in steel and net traps definitely approve. I meet Alastair Sinclair from the Scottish Federation of Creel Fishermen on a pier in Lamlash Bay to ask him why his organisation backs the idea of no-take zones here and elsewhere in Scotland. Everybody benefits, the fishermen will benefit, communities benefit from the fact that the fishermen are benefiting, the recreational sea anglers come to the areas, the recreational scuba divers come to the areas and they better understand just how important the seabed is and that's where we've got to look at the future, for future generations of fishermen, their communities, and the service industries that make their livelihoods from the fishing industry. Alistair, Howard and others are now campaigning for the old three-mile limit, whose scrapping led to the devastation of Lamlash Bay, to be reintroduced throughout Scotland. That would put big restrictions on inshore trawling and dredging for shellfish. 
you hear everybody saying there's no fish on the west coast. There's no fish on the inshore east coast either. And that is due to troll activity. And you can only take so much out of the bank until there's nothing left in the bank. Their hope is that with more no-take zones and other protection measures, Scotland can put something back into the bank for future generations. For DW in Lamlash Bay, Scotland, I'm Richard Baines. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. One animal equally at home in the water and on land is the frog. Delicate, bulgy-eyed and long-legged, frogs have lungs to breathe on land and underwater they can breathe through their skin. Here in Germany, we've just had frog breeding season, where for a couple of months, ponds erupt in a cacophony of croaks and male frogs' cheeks bulge out like they're blowing bubblegum on either side of their mouths. These frogs are loud And I wanted to better understand what goes into the many and varied frog calls that we hear in nature. So I called up Jodie Rowley, a frog biologist from the Australian Museum who spends a large chunk of her time trying to figure out who's who in the frog world just by their call. Essentially, I'm a conservation biologist that is obsessed with frogs. In fact, she and her team have created an app called Frog ID that people can use to record and identify frog calls. It's basically a frog shazam. If you don't know what Shazam is, it's a mobile app that people use when they hear some music and they want to know what the song is. The app uses the phone's mic to identify what it is. So this is the frog version, except instead of artificial intelligence, there's a real-life frog nerd on the other end, listening to the uploaded recordings and identifying the frog behind the noise. Each species of frog has a different call. So simply by hearing the, the ribbits, the chirping, the whatever the, the noise is that frogs of different species make, we're able to just press record using the app and then it's automatically uploaded with latitude, longitude and everything. So it, it makes helping understand our frogs really easy. Then I guess the, the tricky bit then comes when the calls get submitted. There's a team of biologists at the Australian Museum that then listen to every single one of those amazing recordings and identifies the frogs calling. And there might be up to, I think we're, the record so far is 12 different species of frog calling in one 30-second recording, which is pretty excellent. So far, more than 200,000 recordings have been uploaded to the database, and Jody said the app has helped her research team massively increase the amount of data they had previously collected over decades. But wait, identifying which frog is which is cool, but why spend all this time putting them in a database in the first place? Frogs are in a lot of trouble. So about 40% of all frog species are threatened with extinction, and that's just the species that we know of. There's still maybe 20%, maybe more, uh, of undescribed, unscientifically described species on the planet. So in many cases, we're now even losing species before we even know they exist, which is pretty terrifying. And one of the obstacles in conserving frogs, figuring out which species need our help the most, which are doing fine, which, which are disappearing, is that we just don't know that much about them. It turns out the ribbit and the croak are basically the stock photos of frog sounds. They don't even get close to encapsulating the breadth, the bizarreness and the unexpectedness of frog calls, which are basically frog love songs, males singing out to attract females during mating season. Jody sent me a few recordings that people have submitted and we took a listen. Okay, I'll start with one of my favourite frogs. It's a very haunting kind of noise. Whoa. <laughs> I'm not picturing a frog right now, that's for sure. So that's the moaning frog, and it calls quite commonly around the middle of a Perth. Another one of my favourite is the motorbike frog, which is also from the Perth region. Yes, aptly named. Yeah. 
that's definitely not the kind of call that most people would think of. If you ask a person to make a frog call, that would not normally be the first noise that they made. Okay, so then we have... That. It's the bleating froglet. This is a tiny little frog um, and it, it calls and, and sounds a lot like a sheep. It does sound like a sheep, kind of insect-like, insect sheep-like. <laughs> then we have... All right. So that's a banjo frog. It's one of the most iconic kind of Eastern Australian frogs. It also has a really crazy common name, particularly that's used in in the south of, of the mainland of Australia of the Pobble Bonk, which is kind of quite, I love these common names. It's quite descri- descriptive of that kind of bonk, bonk, or banjo frog, which it does sound a little bit like someone plucking a banjo. So these guys are really common on farm dams along the east coast of Australia, but a really large, round frog. And I think their call sounds kind of like they're a, they're a large, round frog as well. It's very kind of earthy. Yeah, I love how someone listened to that and thought, pobble, bonk. <laughs> so that is a very tiny little frog, the eastern dwarf tree frog, and it's really loud for how big it is it's less than two centimeters in body length green tends to live in ponds and and reedy places things like that and that's a weird frog in that it will sun bask during the day so if you walk out into these places during the day it'll often sit on vegetation around the, the ponds and you can see them and they'll even call during the day as well but they're they're a tiny little very abundant frog it's kind of instrumental but also kind of like a zipper as well like a very stiff zipper and the next one we have is that is the stonemason's froglet or toadlet, and and there's actually frogs in the background that you could hear. Which one of them was the northern laughing frog, which was like Wah! but the one in the foreground, um, the little stonemason's toadlet. That it's sort of named because it does sound a little bit like someone hitting a hammer onto a rock. It does. It does sound like stones being clinked together. And again, another very tiny frog, less than two centimetres in body size, not a tree frog, so lives on the ground, um, but that makes a really loud call for its body size. I can hear, actually, there was a couple of frogs in the background that I heard first, but that's the Blue Mountains tree frog. And that has quite a variable call, like a little kind of intro and a growl. In the background was the common eastern froglet and a whistling frog as well. Wow. It gets complicated when there's a cacophony, kind of an orchestra of frogs. It is a really good chorus. So imagine 12. It it is quite musical. Sometimes it sounds like a dance party. So particularly if you get one of these banjo frogs or the related frogs that bring in the drum, you know, like the bonk, 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 and they kind of get a bit of a rhythm and then you end up with the the red tree frogs, for example, that just have this eh, but when there's a lot of them, it's kind of this wall of sound in the background and then you get like the little uh, accents from the other frogs. So it can be inc- incredibly, uh, incredibly musical. I know that whenever I happen upon a frog in the wild or in my home, which doesn't happen anymore in Germany, I'm, I'm stoked. They're such delicate creatures. They kind of look alien-like, just beautiful little marvels of nature. Was that also part of the idea behind the Frog ID project to sort of foster this connection with the community and frogs? To me, it was it was not ever really the first option or things that, things that I thought of at the beginning of the Frog ID project. I'm a scientist. I was just, you know, obsessed over the amazing data that we would hopefully get that would hopefully turn things around for frogs. But what has become clear over the course of this project, I think possibly the bigger impact and the greater importance resulting from this project has been that connection. And I do think it is very true that we can't really care about or fight to protect things that we don't know or don't love. And so Frog ID, you know, from the feedback we've had from people, it has given a lot of people this connection with nature and also connection with their own family. So grandparents taking their kids out to the dam and and showing them the frogs and 
people just writing to say things like, you know what, I never, I never thought or saw or heard frogs. Like, you know, and now it's all I see and hear. Uh, I do think that frog ID has been remarkable, not only in the data, but also in, in connecting people. And we need that more than ever because we need everybody to fight for what we have. What is life like for frogs in Australia right now? While we're just coming to terms and with living with COVID uh, and, and trying to get around that, frogs have been dealing with a pandemic of their own in Australia and around the world. It's called the amphibian chytrid fungus, and it's it's a type of kind of really ancient fungus that actually infects frogs' skin. So they're dealing with disease, they're dealing with climate change, pollution, habitat loss and modification. Frogs are really sensitive to any kind of change. Some species would be totally fine in the middle of a city in a polluted pond, but most species are really, really sensitive uh, and many species really do need really good habitat. What do frogs tell us about our environment? What signs are they giving us? Frogs are letting us know that our environment is in a bit of trouble in some places. So they are some of the first things to go. And when they go, unfortunately, we do know from other parts of the world where frogs have disappeared, like some streams in Panama where there used to be 80 species and now there's only a handful. You know, we know that the streams start to kind of clog up with algae, that no other animal there steps up to fill its role, that all the other animals, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals that relied on frogs for food, they start to then disappear too. So there's this huge ripple effect. So I think we do have, obviously, a lot of environmental problems. But for most species, we still are at the point where if we give them a chance, they can recover as well. And frogs can, pun intended, bounce back. The Frog ID app is currently only available in Australia, but you can listen to the recorded calls online at frogid.net.au. And that brings us to the end of this week's Living Planet. As always, if you'd like to listen to past episodes of the show, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. And to read more of DW's environment reporting, visit dw.com slash environment. We're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Just search DW Global Ideas and Environment. Thank you to our studio team this week, Ileana Giladucci and Gerd Georgi. And thanks also to you for listening. We'll be back next week with more environment stories from around the world. I'm Charlie Shield. Catch you next time. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Living Planet from Deutsche Welle. If you'd like to hear more of their environment stories, you can find Living Planet wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll be back with new episodes of The Wild later in the fall. I'm Chris Morgan. Thanks for listening.